For the 2003 Iraq invasion, Pentagon planners needed a new model for managing the media. The new model became the embedding system. From the Pentagon's perspective, this was quite ingenious. Embedding journalists with frontline troops produced a coverage of the 2003 Iraq war that not only retained a spectacular element, but that also became more interactive. So what we get in 2003 is the emergence of a more interactive, participatory form of war, where the viewer is not assumed to be a passive citizen spectator, but an engaged citizen soldier. As policy planners start to design the 2003 Gulf War, they implement the embedded reporting system, which is a lot more sort of interactive, asking individual re reporters to tag along with individual units. And the task here was to take the universe of stories that is already available to the viewer in the form of Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan and transform that through the embedded reporting system into some sort of more interactive experience that looks a lot less like the war as spectacle and a lot more like war as reality TV. The similarities between reality TV and embedded journalism in 2003 were not coincidental. Rather, the idea of embedded journalism was modeled directly on an experiment in reality television called Profiles from the Front Line. Profiles from the Front Line was a cooperative venture between ABC and the Pentagon announced in 2002. It was jointly produced by Jerry Bruckheimer, the director of Top Gun, Black Hawk Down and Pearl Harbor, and Bertram van Münster, the creator of a number of highly successful reality crime shows on US television. Profiles from the front line featured cameras that followed US soldiers in Afghanistan, mixing police raids with human interest stories. Victoria Clark, who was the PR manager under Rumsfeld, devised an experiment uh, in 2001 where they allowed some uh, TV producers to tag along with soldiers during the Afghani invasion. And this was later turned into a reality TV show, much like Cops, called Profiles from the Front Line. And it was shown in uh, January and February of 2003 in the buildup to the Iraq War. And it was so successful that uh, Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney decided that they would use it as a model by which the embedded reporting system was designed. So it was a way of allowing the press in to the conflict and allowing access, in fact, unprecedented access to the soldiers themselves, while maintaining strict controls over what those reporters would see and the stories that would emerge from their pens and their cameras. Resonant with the reality TV genre and modeled on profiles from the front line, the system of embedded reporting transformed the media coverage of the 2003 Iraq war. But in what ways and how did it work? For one, this was a much more expansive media operation than the pooling system in the 1991 Gulf War. This new arrangement encompassed at least 600 journalists. And these journalists came from a much wider range of publications and from media outlets that had in no way been close to the action in the Gulf War of 1991. So it was striking that the Pentagon now wanted representatives from lifestyle magazines. This was a big innovation, soft news, you might say. So Men's Health magazine, GQ, Esquire, MTV had an embedded reporter. This was not simply the handful of big network news organizations. And this, we might imagine, was a, a purposeful expansion to try to bring the war to a different kind of audience, people who didn't necessarily watch nightly TV news, who were, if you like, the inattentive public, but who could be yoked into the war and a particular appreciation of the war through reading about it in magazines that really ostensibly dealt with altogether different topics. This arrangement was also very different in as much as it was a more international body of reporters who were allowed to embed alongside the troops. In the 1991 Gulf War, it was exclusively French, British and American reporters who were allowed a handful of places in the pool system. 
This time, it was a much more expansive international body, including Russian news outlets and even the old arch enemy Al Jazeera that were allowed to embed. The message was that, at least on paper, the embedding system was a much more open, friendly and accessible arrangement. And of course, the biggest difference was that this time, journalists were allowed to spend significant amounts of time with frontline combat troops. Cast back to the Gulf War in 1991, and the biggest complaint reporters had made was that they were based in the Saudi desert, in a tent city, close to military advisors, but far from the action. They were stuck in the rear, and they never really made it into Iraq for the duration of the war. This time, however, the emphasis was on action. The result was a lot of exciting and thrilling footage, broadcast live from the battlefront to the home front. Footage of military vehicles hurtling through the desert. Cameras were placed on tanks and armored personnel carriers. Admittedly, this became a bit repetitive after a few days, but one of the thrills of the footage was its liveness. This was now the age of rolling 24-7 live news coverage. And part of the thrill of watching the war unfold in real time was knowing that the reporter and the troops were in action and that we were seeing what was happening to them as it was actually happening. The war unfolded like a reality TV show. And one of the effects of the liveness of embedded reporting was that it heightened a sense of identification. It generated an emotional bond between the battlefront and the home front, between the soldier and the citizen. This was part of the Pentagon's calculus, that the embedded reporter would form a connective emotional bond that our point of affiliation and our point of empathy would be through the eyes, the ears and the stories of the embedded journalist. According to Carl Conetta, this was one of the most simple framing mechanisms the Pentagon achieved in Iraq. At the simplest level, it's that um, the people who are fighting this war are ordinary people. They're just like you. Um, we want you to feel the bond. Uh, they are your children. Um, and uh, their circumstance is difficult. Um, and they are operating under threatening uh, conditions. We, we want you to appreciate this and to be there with them. Um, and this, of course, is important to, uh, to, to troops as well, the sense that people are with them. But that is one of the simplest framing mechanisms, because now this war uh, that exists for them every day over there also exists for us every day over here. To strengthen the emotional bond between the battlefront and the home front, the Pentagon oftentimes paired news outlets with troops from the same region of the United States. This resulted in a lot of human interest stories, on how our boys and girls from here were doing over there. I can tell you that as a journalist, you go in there and you're aware of the pitfalls of the arrangement. Proximity to one side, no access to the other side, an imperfect situation. And even when you're cognizant of some of the problems that can come out of that, you're still almost powerless as a human being not to fall victim to some of them. These people are feeding you. You know, they're giving you shelter. When I was in Somalia, I slept soundly one night because you know, our house was being guarded by four U.S. Army Rangers, elite forces. And I could sleep that night knowing that anyone who would try to go out, come to, for us, those guys would lay their lives down before letting them get to us. It's, you know, and I just think people who, who say that I can go into an embed and maintain my neutrality, my impartiality, my objectivity, I think those people are either kidding themselves or they're just flat out lying. The problem with those arrangements is they give a very, very one-sided view of a two-sided story. In fact, as one study of the first month of the U.S. media coverage of the Iraq war has shown,
Some 70% of news reporting focused on the US soldiers themselves, their heroism, their daily privations, how they missed their loved ones, and whether or not they enjoyed their meals ready to eat. Some 20% of the news reporting focused directly on the personal experience of the embedded reporter. How they were doing, what it was like being at the front line to be embedded with combat troops under fire. And only the remaining 10% of the news coverage focused on the overall unfolding of the war itself. What this meant was that the embedded reporting produced a particular type of focus. A focus that permitted viewers a historically unprecedented and live insight into the war, but one that was structurally limited, highly filtered and staged. And this, according to experts, was one of the intended framing objectives that underpinned the Pentagon's media strategy in Iraq. In many ways, I think that's one of the great achievements of the Iraq war from the, from the military's point of view, both the British military and the US military. Because what they've been able to set up this time is a system where each uh, photographer or camera crew feels that they're operating with incredible freedom without constraint, but within an overall structure that has really conditioned the sort of coverage that is going to be produced by their work. So the majority of photographers who I'm familiar with who have worked in that system have reported very little constraint on a day-to-day -day basis operating with a military unit in zones of conflict on the front line or whatever. But by embedding them with that military unit, They've allowed them only a very narrow frame of view that they can have. So it's freely obtained, but it's particularly framed. And that's the great achievement. That, that means that the story has been about the heroism, the particular conduct of the war on that front line. Very, very tactical and not strategic in that sense. Because when you're on that front line, in that narrow view, with that one unit, you don't have a comprehensive account of the war. You couldn't possibly provide a comprehensive account of the war. I think what you get then is you get a very, very accurate description of the grunt's eye view of the war. What you don't get is any kind of perspective analysis of the big picture. The big picture has to be provided then by journalists who are based in Washington or New York or who are removed from the front line of fighting. There's no question though that it improves the quality of the reporting coming from the battlefield it doesn't necessarily improve the analysis. This is a, a staged process, it's a limited process. We think about does the embedding of so many reporters on the battlefield, does it give us an objective view of this war? Objective meaning do we see both sides now? Uh, do we experience the war uh, in the way that civilians do as well as soldiers? And I think the answer is obviously no. One would have to embed uh, with Afghan families, uh, with Iraqi insurgents, uh, with Al-Qaeda, to really have a sense of all sides seen, um, which I think is a, a, a traditional definition of, of objectivity. Um, so the selectivity of the embedding process, I think, is the most profound filter. This filtering of the media coverage produced what people in the Pentagon called a soda straw view of the world. In other words, a perspective that is very deep, very narrow, very tactical. It purports to be a vision of war that if one were to add up the hundreds of micro perspectives of soda straws together, we would get a full spectrum vision of the war. That's the inherent promise. But what we cannot get from these very narrow apertures that dig us into the particular range of vision is a sense of the politics of the war. We cannot get a sense of the larger interpretive framework within which war unfolds. Of why it is that these soldiers are in Iraq. Of why they're hurtling through the desert or of what the larger geostrategic purposes behind Operation Iraqi Freedom may have been. It allowed the Pentagon to keep larger questions over the legitimacy of the war at bay, 
by rooting us in a particular spot where it was almost impossible to ask those sorts of questions. Instead, each soda straw view brought the reporter's and the soldier's perspective into complete alignment. It ensured that audiences would apprehend the war through the military's sight, a spectatorial position that would enhance popular support for the invasion of Iraq. After all, the viewpoint of soldiers under fire is hardly conducive to critical reflection on the war's politics. Survival is the sole preoccupation. And when the dominant trope of reporting is that of deadly threat, real or potential sniper fire, roadside bombs or rocket attacks, the invading forces necessarily do not appear as aggressors, but as beleaguered victims. The only possible spectatorial position from the embedded journalist is one of, in effect, beleaguerment. We see the journalist with the troops in action, but we understand the troops to be in a position in which they are taking fire, they're in danger. The troops are never the agents of harm themselves. They are not a force which is one of occupation, which is one which animates profoundly conflicted and indeed often hostile responses from the Iraqis who are ostensibly being liberated by them. In embedded journalism, almost necessarily, the troops are there and they are in danger. They are victims of insurgents, of those who are not responding in appropriate ways to their presence. That's necessarily how embedded journalism reports the US presence in Iraq. From this perspective of beleaguerment, larger questions about the legitimacy of Operation Iraqi Freedom simply couldn't be broached. The spectatorial perspective created by the embedded reporting did not allow a critical space for the coalition military to be understood as anything other than an imperiled force of liberation. As we could see, the Pentagon's new model for managing the media in 2003 was highly innovative and sophisticated. And from the military's perspective, it proved extremely successful. It produced a thrilling reality TV type coverage of the war that captivated audiences by trapping them in a highly filtered, very narrow and one-sided perspective. And it depoliticized the conflict through a theater of spectacles by which larger questions of the war's legitimacy were kept at bay.